and good morning. It's Pat Zemer here. I trust you can hear me. Uh, I had a little uh, discombobulation this morning as I was getting set up, as it always goes. You get ready to do something and you're using your uh, your laptop as your camera and all of a sudden uh, uh, my camera goes out on my laptop, starts blinking, can't get it set back up, so it's either a hardware issue inside the uh, laptop or something else. So quickly I had to scramble, set up another camera, which meant the background that I normally use uh, was not in place, so we're, we're, I'm in, what I'm in front of here this morning is our green screen. Uh, green screen is where you can put other images behind you uh, in a video as you go. So uh, this morning uh, we have the green screen going, and uh, welcome aboard, and we hope all goes well from here. We certainly are uh, shooting for that to happen. So again, welcome to the first of the live uh, MagnaWave office hours. We'll do this every Tuesday at 9 in the morning and then again at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The purpose of this uh, particular office hours segment is to answer questions. If you have questions about devices, questions about training, questions about anything that uh, you want to know about, uh, PEMF in general, how it works, what, what are the differences in different power devices, any type of information like that, we want to be here to answer your questions and uh, see that you get the information that you're looking for. There's a lot of information out there. I mean, you can stop and think about it for a minute and there's many different websites, many different presentations on types of equipment, power of equipment, different models of machines and, and the whole thing. And it can really become quite uh, confusing to, to many folks when you want to see something that is uh, to answer all of your questions and it's, it's tough to get to the bottom of it. I mean, there's a world of information out there and, and, uh, and it's, it's all good. It's all good to learn from and all PEMF is good, but there are differences and there is information, some information is not as clear as uh, it, it could be or should be. And so that's part of the reason that we're here is to help uh, help those situations along. So uh, with that said, if you have any questions, I can see who's with me. I think I'll be able to see the questions as they come up on the screen. Uh, if they don't, uh, 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 Nick Stover is in the uh, room with me and he is, is following it on Facebook. He can, if you post a message or post a question on the Facebook page, he'll be able to then relay it to me and we'll see that uh, you get the answer uh, that you're looking for. So uh, with that, I think I'll begin. There are some things that, that uh, obviously uh, people have been asking us this week. I want to show you some different features, some different things that we do, how our various uh, pages work, how our private group works, where our training is and what it looks like. I want to show you some of that so you really have an example of, of what's behind the scenes here at MagnaWay. Uh, for, for that being said, it, it's a much different game today than it was back in uh, 2005, 2006 when we uh, first uh, got started with this whole process. Uh, really when I got started with PEMF, probably east of the Mississippi River there were only a handful of machines, not very many machines at all. There were some machines in chiropractors offices and some uh, acupuncturists used them a lot back in, at that point in time, still do today. Uh, in the horse world, there were some machines on the uh, West Coast, uh, hardly anything here on the East Coast. Uh, a few private people had older type of machines that were out there. And so that's what was going on back in 2005, 2006, and 2007. Just not much going on. Today, there's thousands of machines all over the United States from various manufacturers, uh, all types of different information out there. And so it's just become uh, much more competitive, which is fine. I have no problem. We at MagnaWave have no problem with competition. Uh, we always say, you know, when it comes to uh, what sets you apart from somebody else or from the other providers. Well, what I, what I always tell somebody is make sure you're comfortable with the people that you're dealing with. If they give you the answers you want, if you feel that you're at home with them and, and you feel like they're going to support you down the road, then make that choice, whoever it may be. Uh, but that's the important thing to look for because a lot of the different devices are very similar. And But when you get into potentially service issues or support issues uh, with protocols or how things operate, that's where uh, the situation quite often uh, begins to change. And so that's what I always say is try to find somebody that you're comfortable with that, that has a support staff <clears throat> that can help you. And and that's what that's what we always try to do. But uh, 
to that standard when I said it started with just a few machines and, and grew from there. What I want to kind of touch on, because we've been getting asked a lot the last few days, uh, there is some um, uh, movement within the industry about training and where it's coming from and how it's done and what's right and, and what's wrong. And I can say that, that it that kind of happened to us. When we first started, I was running around the country doing treatments, just treating one horse after another, go to one farm, one show, whatever it may be, from the racetrack to California to Thermal to Wellington and Florida, every place that there was to go, I was running around treating horses. And then people said, you know, I want to have one of those machines. You're leaving St. Louis. The first day it happened, uh, we were in St. Louis at uh, Lake St. Louis Horse Show. And uh, we were treating some folks, and uh, at the end of the weekend, one uh, young lady came up to me and said, hey, you're leaving town, and I want to be able to continue to treat my horses. Why don't you sell me that machine or sell me one of those machines? And I thought, hmm, that's something. We could uh, sell some machines. And that was one of our first early sales. And then we had a very early sale at, at Churchill Downs, which was kind of my home track in the beginning. That's where I was treating uh, horses primarily when I wasn't traveling the country going to shows. <clears throat> but with that started the whole thing of people wanting to have machines, treat in their neighborhoods, treat in their cities, go to the shows around them, uh, that type of situation. And it just grew from there. Well, over the years, initially, uh, someone would buy a machine and I would stay with them. I'd train them. I'd work with them. I'd show them everything that I knew, how to best apply it, and what, and what to do. And at the time, I was treating thousands of horses a year, traveling to Dubai to treat horses, traveling all over the different uh, locations to treat for different folks, but uh, I was doing it that way. But as the people, the number of machines grew and people were farther away from us, uh, everybody didn't want to come to, co to Louisville to be trained or they didn't want to, they wanted me to come to them, but we couldn't work out a schedule or just all that type of situation. So we decided, well, what we really need is a, a form of training that can go on, that we can cover the history, we can cover how the device should be operated. We can cover how the device does operate. So everybody's on the same page. That's what we really wanted to do, was have everybody understanding the verbiage that was used, understand uh, how the application would work, how quick it would work, uh, how many treatments it would take to achieve different, uh, different result patterns. And so we instituted an online training course uh, just for horses at that point in time. So it was, uh, we thought pretty extensive and it is kind of extensive in terms of what we go over uh, with the information that we provide and the protocols that are that are provided to, to help people from that point. Then as time went on, we had uh, small animal veterinarians that became involved or people, it was interesting. People used to ask me uh, all the time, well, how did you build your business? What did you do to, uh, to make things happen? And I said, well, really, I got my horses by treating the owners or treating the trainers. They had sore backs, they had sore knees, and I'd say, hey, let me show you what this thing will do. And we'd sit down for five or ten minutes, treat their knees, treat their back. They'd get up, they'd say, my gosh, I feel better. Okay, go treat my horse. So we'd treat their horse, they'd get on the horse, or the rider would get on the horse and ride off to the ring. And this is immediately after a treatment at that point in time, and they'd come back and say, my God. That horse changed leads like it never has. That horse uh, paid attention to what I was asking it to do. He always leaned this way and he would go differently or he was fresher than he's been in the past. He really had better range of motion. He really went after the jump and, and all those types of situations. And so that's that's how it, it got that's how I got my horses, was by treating the people. Then I got the horses, then they wanted me to treat their dogs. So we treat the dogs, and then, then people started asking questions, and veterinarians came along and said, hey, we'd like to use this in our small animal practice. So that came along, and people wanted to treat their, as I said, the, the dogs of their trainers and, and owners of the horses and so forth. So we wanted to have uh, a training level to show those people how, where to place the coils, what indications that were very effective with dogs and small animals. And we've even treated chickens and rabbits and, and pigs. There are people that are in this business primarily treating pigs. Uh, show pigs, by the way, and so there's you know there's any little niches that are available for people to uh, to participate in. So that's what we did. We went and treated uh, the people to get the horses, and once we had the horses, we treated the small animals, and the training went from horses to small animals to to humans. So we wanted to cover all the various indications. 
and our training is uh, we have doctors that participate in our training. Dr. Marty Goldstein uh, is very heavy into our, our equine training and, and things that we're adding there all the time. So we've grew to cover all three areas of training and we tested. We wanted people to take a test, so we knew that they understood the verbiage that we were going to use, how the machine works, how to take care of the machine, all of those types of different uh, situations <clears throat> with regard to that, and then, like I say, the testing. And as, as time went on, uh, we began to call it certification. And certification just being, this is what it is. We're giving you a certificate. There's a lot of different companies that offer certification for their services, whether it's automobiles or air conditioning or whatever it may be. They want they want it, the, the customer to know that the people using this particular, these services are, in fact, trained to some level uh, of expertise. And, and there are many people who have been trained that, that go very deep and learn very much. And frankly to say, there are people that, that have been trained and come through our system uh, who at this point in time know a lot more than I do and have trained, have potentially uh, learned some things that by treating their horses over the years that, that is new to me, which is a very good thing. And I enjoy that. For, for the longest time, when someone would ask a question, uh, it was me. And But now we have a, a forum that people go to once they finish our training. There's 200 plus members in that forum. Uh, I'll show it to you here in a minute. And and uh, where people can ask questions and there's 200 people, including veterinarians, doctors, uh, uh, practitioners will come in and say, this is what I do. Farriers will come in and say, this is how I treat this particular situation. Here's the success that I have had. And so that's a very valuable uh, place that we have for people to go to be able to learn again and understand uh, what we're doing with this device. And again, if you have any questions, uh, simply uh, put them into the into uh, the box on the Facebook page, and we'll be sure to uh, answer those questions as we go along. So then what happened with the training, uh, it, it was just there. No one was really concerned about it, but we were, we were educating our people to the best of our abilities. We were adding anatomy classes, and there was anatomy of part of it. So we, again, we go as, as in-depth as we felt we needed to do. I even contacted some accreditation boards and said, well, I'd like to become accredited. What should I do? And they said, well, create a program and start doing it and then submit it to us and we'll tell you what you need to add and we'll help you guide yourself in different directions because there's going to be a point in time when you want to be able to take this to the state level or national level in terms of accreditation or acceptance at, at various levels of, of the business or the industry and, and that's what we've been working towards over these years since we've been in the training process. Then there became a situation that there were a lot of machines out there in the field being utilized in various, and again, I'm talking equine, um, uh, uh, venues and, and types of horse shows. And, and some of the uh, owners or the vets or the stewards of the racetracks or whoever it was started saying, well, wait a minute, who's, where are these people coming from and where are they and are they being trained? And the fact of the matter is there weren't a lot of companies during doing training at that point in time, much more than here's how it works. Plug it in, turn, adjust it here, put it over here, don't turn it too high until you're used to what it'll do, was about the extent that everybody did at the beginning. And because it's not hard to learn how to use the device, it just takes a little time to learn how to read what the device is telling you and the best decide what is the best way to treat your, your person, your animal, or your, your horse, or your, your small animal. So what happened was, all of a sudden, uh, uh, some people were saying, well, let's make sure that, that folks are trained. And so we went to the stewards of the various racetracks. That's where it really started. And to the uh, state associations, uh, racing associations, and said, here's what we're doing for our training, and uh, here's how in depth we go, and, and here's what happens to them. They take a test, and this is how it goes. And one by one, these various uh, uh, racetracks in New York and in Kentucky, Indiana, uh, various places would say, okay, Pennsylvania, we went to Pennsylvania, I took a veterinarian with me, we went to Pennsylvania, uh, appeared before the Racing Commission, showed them what we do and, and how we did it, and they said, fine, it's all right for uh, 
uh, to utilize this equipment on our track. And so it even got, it even to the point that once in a while someone will go to a racetrack to uh, go on and treat or to a venue and the, and the stewards will call us and say, we have number one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, can you tell us who that is? And if they're uh, certified and trained by in your process and we'll say, yes, yes, it is. That's who this particular person is. And then they would let them on. Some cases, there were times when racetracks were not letting people on if they had not had some type of recognized training. What's recognized training? Well, we were at that point probably the only recognized training. And so competitors began to add training and that's fine. Uh, they would add it and, and uh, create their, their credentials or their certification, whatever they wanted to be. And then if uh, various uh, stewards would accept that, fine. We, we have no qualms with any of that, but that's how it all shook out and, and developed at that point. So I see we have a question here, which I want to get to, but I, I want to take this just a step further as I'm kind of outlining this, uh, this education. So now what's happened is you, you, you kind of get to a point, and I'll be very candid. There was a point in time when we were building our business to where you know, we were one of the only players really getting deep into the equine world and small animal world. Other people were out in the human aspects of things. And, and all of a sudden, momentum was there, and we kind of got a target on our back. People started saying, well, their certification isn't any good, or our certification is better, and da-da-da-da-da-da. And instead of saying, well, okay, from my point of view, you know, if you go to medical school at Xavier in Ohio, uh, doesn't mean that you can't practice medicine in Kentucky. It means you come to Kentucky and you do, you get clearance and you get your boards and you do that and, and you're allowed to do that. So all forms of education to me are valuable as long as they're very actual education. Uh, not, you know, there are people in the beginning who threw three or four videos up and that was their, that was their training. In a sense, we were doing that at the very beginning as well. So that's not all bad, but you have to get through that type of situation <clears throat> as you move forward. So recently there's been questions, who governs your certification program? What is the governing body? Well, in all reality, there is no governing body of PEMF as we understand it today. Sure, it, it would fall under the FDA if the FDA would decide we're going to go after all these people that are doing this or doing that. But the basis is these devices, for the most part, are legal, off-the-shelf devices, class 1 or class 2 devices that don't require FDA clearance to be utilized. So you can buy a machine, use it, and, and operate as you will. The problem becomes if someone makes a claim, someone says they're going to heal something. So all those things that, that most people that are in alternative uh, uh, integrative uh, therapies or modalities uh, have to make sure they're clear in what they say and what they do when it comes to what they're talking about as far as the therapies and the services that they provide uh, to their to their customers. And so that's, the you know, will there be a governing body at some point in time? Absolutely. Whether that's an association or whether that's a, uh, the, the, all the state board, veterinary boards get together and say, this is how we're going to approach this and this is what we're going to require, uh, then things, then things may change. Uh, but as far as a governing thing, we govern ourselves. We, we ask for reports from people. If someone has a complaint about a practitioner, we go to the practitioner and say, we wish that you wouldn't do that. In some cases, we've suspended practitioners from being able to, to say that they uh, can use our name and say that they're certified by MagnaWave and those types of, those types of things. So we have that basis that, that we move on. Uh, and but we'd be very happy as things continue to develop and, and there's uh, again maybe some master association of PEMF professionals that people can go to and that it has a code of ethics like much like the National Association of Broadcasters the radio and TV stations follow those guidelines and they, that's a voluntary agreement the FCC can step in and say well you have to do this or you have to do that so that whole kind of thing is under development but you know for someone to ask today well what who governs yours teaching and this, the question goes the other way. Well, who governs so-and-so's teaching? It's just nebulous at this point that there's education available, people calling it different things, credentials, certifications, uh, whatever it may be. And the, the bottom line is, are people using it properly? And then that's another thing. There's people buying machines that are not getting any education. There's people that are buying machines, getting education and not applying it properly. That's the same in most any, uh, profession that you go in, whether it's mechanics or law or medicine, whatever it is, there's people that don't follow the rules and try to get around them and do things differently. And that, that's the same with everybody. Was it a problem for us in the beginning? No, because there weren't very many. 
Today, when you get up to where you got a couple, two or three hundred practitioners from around the country, there's going to be some that don't follow the, the regulations or don't uh, do things or they take advantage of things or they say things that they shouldn't be saying. But all that said, that's here. So that's a little bit. I hope that helps. That's kind of a description of the education process as we have uh, moved along. And I'm sure that we may discuss that further. But let me take a look here and see that uh, um, what the questions are. It says, um, lady asked the question, hi, Pat. I noticed that with the Zoom box and paddle box that the box doesn't prevent the horse from putting his weight on the paddle. Will the horse's weight damage the Zoom paddle? The quick answer to that is no. The uh, the box is there to protect the paddle somewhat from the from the uh, the hoof and the and the horseshoe and and that type of thing. But the fact that they're placing their weight on that rubber surface with the box on the paddle, it will not. Uh, harm the paddle. In fact, in the beginning, when we first had the paddle, uh, I was treating horses at, at Churchill Downs Derby Day or before the Derby that were having some uh, hoof issues with the horse standing right on the paddle. Um, I, I wouldn't do that because it will wear out the leather or the paddle and it'll get dirty and, and that type of stuff. But I hope that answers your question, Anika. Uh, let's see here. Another um, uh, oh, there you go. Someone, uh, Nick, thanked uh, Anika for her question. Good deal. Um, Okay, so Ann Stolberg asked the question, did the FDA approval come through on the digital machines? So let me explain where that's at, Ann. Get a little water here if you don't mind. The, the digital machines, the office models of the digital machines are what is what we have in the uh, key uh, for FDA approval. The FDA has given us a classification that these devices fit in. Now, the step for FDA approval is that in, in order to, and there's, this is going to get a little long, not long, but I just I want to answer it totally, Ann. The steps for FDA approval is you need to have some studies, which we have three studies that are paid for, ready to go, and ready to start. And in fact, I should probably explain what our whole logic has been in the FDA process anyway. But for if, if, if you, you don't have to, you can go to a facility and pay for a study with any type of device and they'll do a study and say, we used this device and treated this many people for this much time and this was our result with this device. And that can be published in a medical journal. Uh, if they so desire to do that. And there's a cost associated with that. Some of these studies run upwards of half a million dollars uh, to three quarters of a million dollars to fund uh, to, at the university level or the, or the large hospital level. And all of our studies are fully funded at this point, ready to go. And so you can do that. But what we have chosen to do is for the FDA approval of a device, it has to be UL safety approved. And UL safety approval is a very arduous device. In some cases, it's as difficult to gain that as it is to gain FDA approval once you have that. And so with our new digital devices, uh, to be, I'll just back up, what we were, we were about ready to be FDA approved, uh, I guess three years ago, as what they call a predicate device. That means that your device is like so-and-so's device and doing a very similar function as so-and-so's device. So you're like that. So we'll let you be FDA approved as a predicate device to do this. There was one problem. And this goes back to our manufacturer and to some history. Our devices have been knocked off three or four times uh, by other manufacturers and they began manufacturing. Well, if we uh, were approved as a predicate device, then our competitors and I'm being very candid, our competitors could then go, and their phone's ringing, somebody will get it, then our competitors uh, could then go get approved as a predicate device, and away you go. Well, so what we did is we withdrew the uh, FDA applications and redesigned the digital pieces of equipment and uh, actually obtained some patents as part of those devices, and that is what we're going to take back for the studies those are the devices that are going to be FDA, uh, not FDA, UL safety cleared, and um, then submitted to the FDA as those devices, which means that someone will not be able to take us as a predicate device. So our manufacturer, and it's cost us uh, probably nearly a million dollars if you stop and look at it, what's been spent over the years to obtain this, uh, that's how we are approaching the FDA. 
<clears throat> so our safety clearance, uh, we were told in March, the end of March, we'd have our safety clearance letter. They had asked for three modifications uh, to one of the devices to just make some surge protection issues inside the, inside the case, which all those corrections were made. They told us that we'd have our uh, safety clearance at that point in time. Then all of a sudden there was a letter saying, well, you need to do these three things. And so we had to write back and say, well, these three things have been done, and here's the verification that they've been done. And so what they're playing is mail tag. It's going back and forth. Uh, with the safety a company that's performing the safety tests and uh, uh, I was told again last week that it uh, looks like everything is very clear they haven't asked for any other changes and so hopefully uh, any day the uh, uh, safety inspector the safety testing company will issue that that clearance will have UL safety approval on those on those three devices and then we can then commence with the studies because we want the studies to be with safety cleared devices so that is appropriate to the FDA's uh, challenge that uh, that electrical devices are in fact uh, safety cleared uh, before they gain FDA approval. So Anne, I hope that answers your question. It, it, the, the FDA will move along very swiftly we think or we feel once we get the safety approval completed and that's just pending right now. To that end, as a, from a business standpoint, uh, us and our sister companies that, that represent our factory are the only PEMF company in the country that is conducting safety tests on their equipment. It doesn't mean that other people's equipment's not necessarily safe or they don't use safety tested components in their devices, but they don't submit their machines or their devices for safety testing because they're not interested in FDA approval, not interested in exporting. That's another issue. If you're going to export a machine out of the country for human use, it must be safety cleared. So you can export a device for veterinary use just fine, but if it's going to be exported for human use, it has to be safety cleared. A lot of companies aren't particularly concerned about exporting their devices out of the country. We sell into Canada, we sell to Europe, we sell to uh, Brazil, uh, we, we have business in, in uh, 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 Australia, and so we want to be able to help those people who want the devices strictly for human use to be able to get them. So that's the requirement that we're shooting for there. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's right there. It will be the office devices that will be uh, FDA approved. And it's a double-edged sword. I've had doctors and chiropractors, chiropractors and, and other integrative medicine kind of people say, I really don't want FDA approval. I want to use an off-label in my office as a cash device. People pay me cash. I don't really care about that because when it becomes FDA approved, there will be uh, restrictions and things that they must do according to their uh, licensure and, and being a particular type of a particular type of doctor, whether that be MD, chiropractor, uh, OD, whatever the or DO, whatever uh, the situation uh, may be. So, hope that's clear. If it's not, ask it again. Ask whatever is not clear, and I'd be happy to uh, to answer that. Let's see. Um, it's for all digital devices, regardless of who the manufacturer is. No, the FDA clearance is not for, uh, FDA clearance typically is device, design, uh, use, uh, color, uh, those types of things specific. You'll see that here's an example. There is an FDA cleared PEMF device that's called TMS. They use it for, for strokes, they use it for autism, they use it for depression, and it is an FDA approved device. Now, so that means the modality is FDA approved for that particular type of use. But the, the, the approval goes to that company with that name on that particular device. They call it trans, transmagnetic stimulation, TMS. They don't call it PEMF. But when you get down deep into their, their world, you'll see that it's pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Another one, there's a device that was recently FDA approved, which is a big topic today with uh, Senator McCain's glioblastoma, tumors of the brain. There's been a device made, FDA approved, that it's like a cap that they wear, like a stocking cap, and it's little pads of PEMF coils that penetrate <clears throat> through the skull to help with, uh, hopefully, tumor reduction, slowing of tumor growth, any of those types of situations, <clears throat> and, and that particular device also calls their PEMF something a little different. So they can set themselves apart. They don't call it 
PEMF, they call it something else. So to say that FDA approval will cover all devices regardless of the manufacturer is not the case. It will cover devices from the manufacturer that it gets, gains the FDA approval for their particular device. Uh, now, if there are several people selling a device for a manufacturer, those devices, by virtue of moving along through their sales chain, will be uh, FDA approved. They may have to alter their name of the device that's FDA approved a little bit so it matches in some way the FDA approval. It's kind of like Viagra. Uh, Vi my per I always use this in the, as an example. Viagra, as may most people know, is a heart medication. It was originally uh, formulated as a heart medication. Then they found out that it can be used as an enhancing uh, type of drug. So they got FDA approval, different color, different design, different name, same drug. And, and so it's, it's specific. I hope that helps with, with the explanation. All right, here's a kind of a long question um, from Mr. Schmidt. Uh, I've noticed my back muscles seem tight after my last two treatments with the Max machine. Is it possible that it turned up too far? The, machines, the machine seems to be helping immensely with my herniated bulging disc pain as well as my hip pain. Uh, a surprising benefit is the fact that my BPH seems to be improving with every treatment on my lower back and hips. Well, a funny thing happens when you, when you go to treat. Um, the body recognizes uh, you've got some issues there, Gary. I mean, you've got several little things that, that you're dealing with. The body tends to recognize one pain at a time. You may be hurting all over, but there's a primary place that you're hurting. And so you, 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 your brain's recognizing that pain. And so you go there to treat that area. If it's helping your hip or your herniated disc, uh, all of a sudden it, over here you're getting some tightness in your back. That could be a referral. Uh, could be a referral. However, it, it could be a situation that, depending on where the machine is set, um, two instances here. Um, when I first got started, I'm going back 12 years now, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, some of you who are hunter-jumper people will know the fellow I'm talking about, rode a bicycle, he made bits, and he had the bicycle and he rode around with his bits in his, in his bag because he had, he had a, a bad back and so forth, and so I was at, we were at, um, we were in Wellington, and he came to me and said, man, my back has hurt me. Can, can you treat my back? I said, sure. I'm, I was a novice. We all have to learn what we're doing. So I put the machine on the gentleman's back, began to turn up. He didn't feel anything. He didn't feel anything. And, and I just don't understand. I'm not feeling anything. So I'd turn it up a little bit more. Finally, he started feeling it a little bit. He said, oh, that's great. I, I, that, really, that really feels good. Next day, he was so sore, it, it, it was killing him for the next day. Two days later, he felt wonderful. Kind of like a deep tissue massage, ladies, or men who get deep tissue massages. If, if you get a deep tissue massage, you're a bit sore at, after it's over, then you feel better the next day. That's what he went through. Then he comes to me and tells me, yeah, I was a paratrooper. I did area photography for a long time, broke my back five times. I, I have an incredible uh, pain level tolerance. And so what I did was I turned it up too high. And so, yes, can that happen? Can you overstimulate something that the person can be a little sore before afterwards? Yes. Uh, is it a norm? No, because we don't have to do that. So it's one or two things. It could have been a little high on your back at that point, or it could have been all of a sudden something is showing up because the other stuff, the other areas are feeling better. They're, you're having relief there and something else is showing up. I had that all the time with when I first started with racehorse jockeys. They'd come to me and say, oh, my low back, my low back pad is killing me. Fix my low back. I'd treat their low back and they'd stand up and they'd flex. They'd touch their toes. Oh, it feels great. Next day they'd come back. What'd you do to me? What do you mean? Well, my shoulders are killing me. Well, their shoulders were killing them before, but all the pain was in their low back. So then we treated their shoulders and we kind of followed the pain around to see where it was going. Bingo. They got the relief they were looking for. And you got to do that. You'll see that on a horse. Where is it revert? To or from? Well, we don't diagnose. We don't know necessarily, but we can see where the sensitivity is on a horse and we can work the sensitive areas and, and figure it out wherever it's coming from. That's not our decision. That's the veterinary decision of where it's coming from, but we can, we can show that. I had plenty of times in the beginning when someone would come up to me and start asking me questions and ask me to do a horse and show them, show them what, what the horse is showing me. And uh, turns at the end, I knew you're a veterinarian. You just, and he said, that's exactly what my, what I thought was going on. And that's pretty neat that you can show me that. So again, we talk sensitivity 
and not soreness. So I hope that uh, helps with that question, Gary. Let's see. Um, let's see if there's another one coming up here. Nope, nothing else at, at this point. So if you have a question, uh, just enter it into the uh, box there, and I'd be uh, happy to answer it. Uh, whatever that question may be, it's one of the things that uh, if you go to our website, uh, one of the things that I think sets MagnaWave apart is we try to be totally transparent. If you go to our website, it's all there. The information is there, the research is there, the pricing is there, everything's there. You can go to my website and learn everything and not give me one bit of your information. But I feel like that if you go and you get that information and you want to talk about a specific machine, you'll give me your information and ask for us to call you. Other places require that you give them your information before they'll give you any type of in-depth information. I hate that. I hate that when I go to websites and I, and I refuse to uh, do that uh, with regard to our communication with our customers. We like to be totally transparent and it, it's all there. It, it, it amazes me when somebody will, will come and they'll say, hey, I'm looking for this information and I'll say, hey, if you go to this tab th and this sub tab on the website, there's your information that you're, that you're looking for. And uh, it, it, it just, we do our best to, uh, to have all the information that will be very helpful to help educate you about PEMF and, and what it can do to help um, um, help educate you as to machines as to what you might want if a machine is appropriate for you or if you want to purchase a machine whether it be for personal use business or whatever that situation may be we, again we want to be totally uh, um, uh, transparent in that way in that situation and you're welcome I hope that explanation uh, was clear enough for you um, Again, uh, there aren't many companies out there in this field that are pursuing that level of testing and approvals uh, for their devices, uh, whether it's one, a one device company or a multi device company. And that's a good question to ask someone. What are you doing here? Are you safety testing? Are you interested in becoming uh, FDA approved? If a company doesn't want to ship out of the country and they don't care about selling, uh, to to doctors or having people be able to use their their insurance. Primarily, what the FDA gives you is the ability to charge to bill insurance companies. Doctors can use devices off label or use them how they how they wish, but they can't get paid by insurance. Well, we all know that a lot of medicine is insurance driven, so that's why they want FDA approval so they can charge um, charge for uh, their services. Let's see. Um, uh, Gary again, thank you, Pat. My entire spine has either been broken or has uh, herniated bulging discs. I believe 14 bulging and four herniated, my goodness, discs along with seven broken vertebrae. I cannot believe the relief I've gotten. Pretty certain I turned it up too high against the therapist's advice. Uh, that, that, that happens. By the way, I'm an old horseman who... Uh, I figured if a little was good, a lot is better, lesson learned. And, and that's true. I mean, our devices go up very high. And and there are, rarely does somebody treating the body of a person or a horse uh, or a small animal turn that machine up all the way uh, to the top. Now, when you're treating an abscess or you're treating someone's ankle, you might turn the machine up about as high as it'll go in some cases to get as much energy as you can into the area that that you're that you're working on so but more is not always uh better uh, when it comes to this um it's it's just it's consistent the, the logic that i like to use is you like to put as much energy into an area uh, of indication that is comfortable as long as the person is really comfortable. And what I did in the beginning is I'd turn it up. If I had it on a, a gentleman or a woman or a, a horse, I would turn it up till, they, till they'd say, yeah, that's, that, that, that's fine. Well, I could see in their face it was fine, but they're saying that's what I can take, and I'd turn it down. I don't want what they can take. I want what is comfortable. And, and that's kind of a, a guideline that we, we would work on and train on. Um, so, But that brings me to it. Let me see if we have another question here. Um, Yes, we do have a question. Any experience with shivers in horses seems to cause an episode when I'm treating the pole area. Stifles show inflammation too. Uh, I don't quite understand what, what you mean, uh, Tamara, about your, your total question. Yes, we've had experience with shivers. We've had success. Uh, with in the area of shivers, I could probably pull that up on my notepad and take a look. See there, uh, what what we have seen. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, it seems to cause an episode when I'm treating the pole area. Well, you know, I would say one or two things. You want to, there could be an indicator, if it, here's what I always try to say. If, if I would be treating a horse and, and the horse was not better to some degree after two or three treatments, I would say you need to see your vet. Not that this device is going to turn everything around, but it does have a tendency to show you some things that are going on. And, and it, by the oxygenation and the improved blood flow, a lot of indications can in fact begin to be better, to appear better, to the horse is more comfortable, the person is more comfortable. But if it doesn't resolve to some degree uh, after two, three or four treatments, then there's something deeper going on. There's something going on in the body that, that you want to get to, and it's, it's a, that's a veterinary question. We're not veterinarians. Some of us are veterinarians, not me, but some of the practitioners are veterinarians, and, and they, so they can do that. They can go as take that explanation or thought uh, as deep as, as they want. But I would say, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, if you're up in the pole and you're getting that type of thing, perhaps you're a little high. Turn the machine down. You don't have to. You can be on the pole. To, Clicking sound just as fast as that thing will click, and you'll still watch that horse's head drop. It's not about the power in that point; it's about where you are. So, just be comfortable uh, in that type of situation uh, as you're as you're looking at it. Hope that uh, hope that helps. Um, so, uh, stifles show inflammation as well. Uh, I don't know if you mean after you treat or um, if they're inflamed, and then you then you treat what. What's, what's going on. You're not going to treat the pole in the neck and cause the stifles to become inflamed. There's something else going on there. Um, if you get movement in the stifles, that would be a question I would say. What kind of reaction are you getting in the stifles at your scan? You know, we often scan the horse at a low setting or the animal or the person at a low setting looking for areas of sensitivity. This is where my back is sore. It shows on the horse where they, where they have some sensitivity in the area. And, and I've always I've always said, in fact, there's a, a particular story uh, that, I, that I deal with. I, I was in Michigan um, and, and treating a horse, and a friend of mine who was a veterinarian from Florida was in Michigan at this particular horse show treating some horses, and I treated this woman's horse, this trainer's horse, and uh, I got more movement in the stifles than I normally did when I treated a horse. And so I went to the to the owner and I said, you know, I got some movement in the stifles more so than I normally get on this horse. And when I get in horses in general, you probably ought to have the horse check. Call your vet and have the horse check. Well, she did. And lo and behold, my friend shows up. I didn't know who her vet was. And he comes walking in and he says, so you've determined that this horse has got stifle problems. And I said, no, uh, I, I didn't say that. I said, I saw some sensitivity in the horse that I don't normally see. And I just felt it was something that you should probably look at. He said, okay, I will. I appreciate that you're bringing that to their attention. As far as I know, it's in the sacrum and, and the back, but I'll, I'll take a look at it. So he went on, went on down and looking at the horse, and I went on to treat another horse. Uh, 15 or 20 minutes later, he comes, he comes walking by, and uh, so I know one or two things are going to happen. He's going to stick his head in the stall and say, you keep your damn mouth shut when you're talking about these things, you know, da 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 da, da. Or he's going to walk on by. And sure enough, he walked on by, and I'm saying, Phew. All of a sudden, he stuck his head back in the stall, and he looked at me and said, you were right. I had to treat both stifles. Well, you know, that's what you, you learn the more you do this, where you see things, where you see sensitivity. And, and I was very glad, and he was, and he was glad. And the owner was glad. And so all I did was pointed out some sensitivity that I didn't normally see uh, in the stifle. That brings me to another interesting story, but we're kind of getting close on time here for where we're going to go this morning. And let's see, no other questions at this point. Got another question coming up? Did I miss one? Uh, let's see. Katie, Katie, where is Katie's question? Oh, oh, I, I got it. Can you go over uh, non-sweating protocols in horses? What to do? Uh, how often? What is exactly that is going on when MagnaWave that is going to get the body to uh, start sweating? Well, basically what you're going to do, and there are a couple of protocols. We've had a lot of success when using the, the paddle on, on the neck, the shoulder, and the, and the uh, breast, uh, chest area uh, of the horse <clears throat> when, when there are non-sweating issues. Uh, you need to make sure that you have a fan on the horse so you can keep them cool. You want, you want things to, uh, wait a minute, am I right in that? I, I'm 
kind of drawing a blank all of a sudden. But uh, uh, I've got the I've got the protocol on our on our Facebook page. Uh, but basically, you want to work the muscles, and it helps the circulation within the muscles. Helps open up all the various pores and areas of sweating, and can in fact help them bring them to a a sweating position uh, with this particular session. People do it daily when they have horses that are in a, in a non-sweating uh, type of situation. They use in conjunction with some supplementation. You see, when you use a particular supplement, if you're treating when the supplement is going, you can improve the metabolization of the supplement. So if you're taking a supplement for, for non-sweating and then you're treating at, at the same time, you can uh, bring it out. You don't want to have a fan. If I and I, I apologize, I might have had a little brain issue here, but <laughs> because you want them to be in a state of sweat as you move their muscles and and stimulate them to bring them to a uh, a sweating type of situation. Hope that helps, Katie. Uh, again, it's in the if you go to the uh, and I, I want to show you here. We got a minute. Uh, let's see. There's another question. When I work on a horse's back and SI, the area seems like the back raises up and stays up. Is that common? Well, every horse is different. And so you may be stimulating some action in that horse, kind of getting them to, uh, to, to, to do this with their back as they're trying to release. So uh, do I see that normally when I've treated the sacrum in the back of the horse? No. If you're seeing it and you see it continually, that's another one of those situations that you need to kind of look at the confirmation, uh, who's riding, weight of the rider, saddle fit, uh, all those types of things that could be creating a situation in the horse that when you treat, it kind of, again, again comes up because that's not something that we regularly see uh, in those types of situations. Hope that helps, Sean, um, when, you, when you get into uh, that type of Thing. So what I wanted to do here, if I may, I want to go over to, let's see, which page do I want? Let me get it up here. Um, okay, oh no, that's not it. I want to go here. So let me come over here and take you to uh, this spot. This is our private group area. We have an area where our practitioners, uh, certified practitioners, go and they can ask questions in this area. Um, about various protocols and just in the last couple of days uh, we're talking about vibration plates how they can be complementary therapy to what we're doing uh, we've had questions and you can see there's a lot of answers people get very uh, interested in here about various uh, protocols various complementary methods to use and we get a lot of answers and a lot of interaction that you can learn from uh, when you come into this particular area of the website. Uh, anyone work on a human with spinal cord stimulator in the body? And uh, there are answers to that particular question. It was interesting on that question. Uh, the first indication would be we don't want to do that because we don't want to run down the battery or if it's a self-contained type of situation, we don't want to, uh, we're probably not going to hurt the circuitry, uh, but that's the typical situation and it was resolved that this person in fact has to recharge the battery on her uh, stimulator so could she be treated before she recharged the battery uh, so as to not to run down the battery potentially absolutely there's no reason to think not. now certainly you want to clear that with your doctor is there something that could happen to this to uh, to do that uh, in in the area of uh, um, heart uh, what do they call them defibrillators and uh, What's that other device? What is that other device? Nick? The uh, pacemaker. Thank you. Um, we've had doctors recently, because of some of the new stuff happening with pacemakers, and some of our literature talks about the digital machines only need to be a couple of feet away from uh, those types of situations. But some doctors have said, no, you're going to treat your low back, or you're going to treat your knees, or your ankles, or your shoulders. You can do that, in this, and you have a pacemaker. That's not a blanket approval to do pacemakers. That's just what's happening with technology. And some people are sharing that, and we do that kind of stuff here on the, uh, here's somebody looking for a horse to be treated in Socrates, so we help people uh, spread the word where they're going to be and what needs to be, needs to be done. Uh, here's another question which we get a lot. Can people, can you treat a magna wave, a human with titanium screws in the neck, face, back, and shoulder? And we answer those questions. So those, that's the kind of information that we have on our private forum. A portal for our practitioners to go in and, and get the information uh, that they're looking for to help them uh, with their businesses. 
and, and the practices that they're doing. So um, I wanted to, to show you that to give you an idea, and that goes on and on and on. A practitioner can go in there and uh, put in an indication, um, shivers or stifles or whatever it may be, and anything that's happened in the last seven years that's been talked about in that forum with answers or, or guidelines, we call them guidelines, uh, to how to treat a specific thing, it's there. Seven years worth of information and history, again, from doctors, practitioners, veterinarians, the whole nine yards, and it, it's, it's a wonderful wealth of, of uh, activity and knowledge uh, for the practitioners to learn and to better help them provide their treatments. Uh, let's see, any other questions? No other questions at this point? Okay, um, it's about 10 minutes till 10 Eastern time. Uh, we'll be wrapping up here in, in just a moment or so. So I wanted to, um, uh, to thank you uh, for being here. I don't know how many people were here, but that, we'll figure that out as, as we go along. But uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, kind of brings back some old memories. Back in the 90s, I did some, uh, in another life, uh, I was doing some talk radio. And I, uh, if you remember, the poor guy just died recently. It was a great guy. Alan Combs was a very liberal uh, commentator, and I was more on the central or uh, conservative side of things at that time. And Alan Combs and I used to uh, go around. As a matter of fact, here's my uh, 15 minutes uh, or, or my association uh, with someone, uh, Mike Pence, our vice president, used to do a radio show in Indianapolis. I was doing mine in Evansville, Indiana. Mike Pence was in Indianapolis, and we would confer a lot because we both went round and round with uh, Sean Combs and and, uh, and some other folks, and it was a lot of fun fun doing that at, at that point in time. And so this this has been fun, kind of sitting here uh, sharing with you and talking with you and answering your questions, and, and I look forward to doing that each week. Uh, what would be the best tool for the knees? Question. Uh, well, uh, Serena, you, you know, probably the best device, the best uh, attachment for the knees would be the butterfly because you could open the butterfly up and place it right over the knee, you know, left to right. Uh, if you, if the way, if you've got the butterfly or you've got a circle on the butterfly, the signal is going like this. So if you put that butterfly over the knee with the knee being here, you're going this way through the knee. Or you could close the butterfly, place it on top of the knee, and go down through the knee, put it underneath the knee, and come up through the knee. The situation is that the, we attain the best results when you approach the tissue from different directions and different intensities. So if you use the butterfly on the knee, now that's, with that being said, you could put the large loop right over the top of the knee, kind of buck, you know, hold it down over your knee and turn it up to a comfortable setting and treat your knee with the large loop. You could do the, butt, the paddle. I have some people that treat both knees. They'll simply put the paddle between their knees and it'll go back and forth and treat, their, treat both knees at the same time in a left to right uh, type of situation. But as a rule, I would say your best, apparat, your best attachment for the knees would be the uh, butterfly. Uh, at a comfortable intensity for five to seven minutes. Uh, another little thing here, you know, once you've treated an area, uh, if you treated an area for 15 minutes, you're done. Uh, you don't need to go. If 15 minutes is good, 30 minutes isn't going to be a lot better. The body's got the energy that it needs at that point in that type of treatment time, so you can move on to treat other things. Seven to eight minute treatment time is pretty standard. Uh, 15 minutes is plenty, uh, so just from that perspective when thinking about your knees and the, and the apparatus that you're using. Uh, let's see, uh, knees for horses, same thing, same purpose. Take the butterfly and approach the knee of a horse from the front, and so you're going left to right, spin that butterfly around, and so now you're going front to back on the knee. Uh, very effective to use the butterfly in that in that condition. Now, if you took the large loop, I should have loops. I'll, I'm going to figure this out. I'll bring some loops with me for the two o'clock version of this particular program. Uh, if you take the large loop and you wrapped it around the knee to where you've got a, a, a up and down closed circle on both sides, now you're going up and down the leg. So you can go up and down, left and right, front to back, different intensities. All the tissue likes that. The reason is and I'll be quick because we are running out of time. The reason is um, you don't want, our, we have cellular memory, we have muscle memory. And in, in a horse, if you treat at the same intensity, the same direction, every time, eventually that horse is going to say, I know what's going on here, I don't care. 
And it's hard to think that the cellular membrane is going to do that, but that in fact happens. So when you change the intensity, change the direction, it's always a surprise. They're always open to receiving the energy that you're putting in there. So different directions, different intensities, better results. And uh, for horses knee, that's exactly how I would do it. I would use the large loop sometimes. I'd use the paddle sometimes. I'd use the, because the paddle puts out the energy in a little different fashion than the, than the loops do. Uh, the loops are like a donut. So the energy is kind of coming out, going into the center of the donut. The paddle is like a pancake. So the energy comes out like a bright spotlight. It just shoots right out really thick into that particular area. Again, different intensities, different direction, different, better results. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, um, uh, Serena, and um, uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate the questions. So folks, uh, it's time to wrap up on this section, uh, this session of MagnaWave Office Hours. It, it really has been a pleasure. I hope I've answered some of your questions and I look forward to answering your questions in the future about whatever it may be. And we'll get very deep into this as we go along each week, I'm sure. So uh, for those who want to come back this afternoon, we'll be back at two o'clock with the same format. Uh, same type of activity to answer your questions and to converse with you about uh, better ways to use PEMF uh, to achieve the wellness that you want anytime. Absolute wellness is what we're all about and we want you to have. It, it's fun uh, making people uh, feel better. It's fun making people uh, enjoy their life again. Their horses, uh, seeing horses that, that are able to enjoy their life again. Uh, certainly small animals. I've got stories about my dogs and, and what we've done and how we treat them. So we'll share all that as we go along. So again, um, I'm Pat Zemer, MagnaWave, uh, author, trainer, practitioner, I've been here for, for 15 years, been treating horses with PEMF therapy since 2002. Uh, I have a vast experience and have learned a lot and can learn a lot more. So thanks for being with me, and I look forward to visiting with you again. Have a great morning. Bye.